Good afternoon, and welcome to the Easter Seals Project Action Webinar, Neighborhood Wayfinding, What You Need to Know to Get Involved. All participants will be in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during today's presentation. At that time, an operator will give you instructions on how to ask your questions. If you should need assistance during the conference, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touch phone phone. This conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Christy Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Don. Welcome everyone to today's session on wayfinding. Uh, before we begin the session, uh, I do want to get a few housekeeping things out of the way. Um, the PowerPoint presentation for today's session can be found on the event website. Um, and I'm going to ask my colleague Christian to put that in the chat section right now, just the link to the website where you can find the uh, PowerPoint presentation. It was also, uh, this link, emailed to everyone uh, yesterday who had registered for the event. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be transcribed. Uh, you can obtain that transcription uh, by visiting our website at www.projectaction.org uh, within about 30 days of the event. Um, and you can download that in, in written copy. Uh, if you'd like to receive a copy in Braille or audio CD, um, you can email that request to webinars at easterseals.com. Uh, again, it's webinars at easterseals.com, uh, and be sure to provide us uh, your postal address when you make that request. Closed captioning is available for the event. Um, to uh, access the closed captioning, the easiest way is to press the Control plus F8 key, uh, and you'll get a closed captioning window that you can um, uh, size appropriately in whatever is uh, most convenient for you. Um, with that, I do want to uh, introduce our speakers for today's session. Um, we are pleased to have with us Becky Hunter with the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention at the University of North Carolina uh, and the CDC Healthy Aging Research Network. Um, Becky will be presenting on what wayfinding is and how you can get involved. Uh, and then Mary Douglas Hirsch from the City of Greenville, South Carolina Economic Development Department is going to be presenting on the great wayfinding program that they have in Greenville. Um, we, we definitely want to follow up the presentation with questions from you. So uh, following the presentation, we'll receive additional instructions from Dawn on how you can ask your quest questions to the presenters. Uh, so with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to turn the session over to Becky. Great. Hi there, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here this afternoon. Um, wow. <laughs> I'm sipping through these slides awful quickly here. Um, so I represent the uh, Healthy Aging Research Network. Uh, we are a network of universities across the country. Uh, we have numerous uh, community and national partners. Um, and collectively, we're focused on research, practice, and policy uh, to support healthy aging, which is not to say that we ignore other groups. And I think you'll see that our wayfinding work is really focused across the entire spectrum of, uh, of people. Our work is supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and in particular, the Healthy Aging Program there. Okay, so for this wayfinding initiative that I'm going to be talking about today, we have had uh, an absolutely fabulous group of partners, um, all of which come at the topic from a somewhat different angle. And I think that's really important um, a piece of wayfinding because it's a complicated puzzle and, and d different perspectives have something different to add to the resolutions of the problems that we face, particularly in our country. Um, we're especially grateful for our partnership with Easter Seals Project Action and certainly for the critical work that, that they've been doing in this area. So uh, for the past three years, uh, we've been looking at wayfinding from several different perspectives. Um, we've conducted uh, traditional academic literature reviews. We've developed a conceptual model, and I'll be talking about that a little bit. 
We studied uh, older adult wayfinding in a community in Chicago. Uh, we created a practice and policy compendium and um, a document which we'll be talking about briefly, uh, which we're hoping will be used in an ongoing cross-sector uh, dissemination. So drawing upon that work um, in our session, I'm going to share our definition about community wayfinding, uh, talk a little bit about the links between wayfinding and health and other aspects of well-being. I'm going to highlight some practice and policy issues and explore what each and every one of us can do to influence constructive change. Um, I'm really hoping that each of you will come out of this webinar with some ideas and, and ideally with one or more concrete action steps uh, that you can take to improve uh, wayfinding in your community or, or in your area of focus. So the points I'm going to be covering are available in greater detail in our Pathways document. Um, this document was designed and produced by Easter Seals Project Action, and it's really intended to be a tool for your use. Um, we're, it has a lot of uh, very fundamental information about wayfinding, about uh, promising new directions, uh, recommendations, and we're hoping that people will use it to promote dialogue um, with, uh, you know, to better inform people within their own organizations, but also to create cross-sector dialogue with other people um, who may be in, in, you know, wearing very different hats. Uh, you can obtain this document at our website, and that is prc-han, that's H-A-N dot org. So I think one of the problems with wayfinding is that, you know, if you were to go out in the street right now and stop people and ask them about wayfinding, you're probably going to get some really puzzled looks. So it's something we all do, uh, but by and large we don't talk very much about it or, or we don't even think very much about it unless we have a problem. So for example, and this is just kind of for fun, uh, have you ever missed your turn because of a confusing road sign? Have you ever come to a halt outside a transit station and not know, known which way to turn? Have you ever lost your car in a parking lot? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had trouble figuring out where to cross a busy highway? So obviously, I can't see you, but I'm imagining that there are some heads nodding out there. So you know, as you introduce others to wayfinding, these are some examples, and I'm sure you can think of more that you might use to drive home the relevance of the topic. So there are a couple of key concepts um, that I'd like to encourage you to think about. Where is that next page? Uh, key concepts to think about with regard to uh, wayfinding. So one is the idea of the journey, and the other is the importance of place. So, you know, when we travel, it, it's rare that we just walk, or we just drive, or we just take the bus. So if we take the bus, for example, we probably have to walk to the bus stop. So we want to work toward a vision um, and a plan of action that includes the concept of a really seamless door-to-door -door journey. And then place, yeah, I mean the qualities of place, and in this case the wayfinding environment, influences uh, our everyday lives in so many ways, our access to goods and services, the extent to which we can be involved in the life of our community, um, and certainly their opportunities to engage in healthful behaviors. We're using a, a very simple definition of wayfinding, that is to say uh, the process by which 
people locate themselves and find their way in community settings. So this follows directly from the work of, of urban planner uh, Kevin Lynch, who really over 50 years ago identified the challenges of wayfinding in increasingly complex cities. Um, he recognized that, that while people have been finding their way since the beginnings of time, through forests, deserts, ice flows, to and from communities, that the urban environment really presents very different kinds of challenges. And I use that term urban loosely. I don't mean just megacities, but all types of organized communities. Now what I'm going to do next is to walk you through our conceptual framework. So on the left side of the screen there, you'll see different levels um, through which you can look at wayfinding and potentially intervene. So, so we tend to think about wayfinding from the perspective of individuals. But we might also think about it in terms of groups. So for example, people with visual uh, limitations or impairments are, are clearly, as a group, going to have particular needs when it comes to wayfinding. Uh, communities as a whole, uh, communities tend to be the, um, the locus of control, the decision makers when it comes to wayfinding uh, in many regards. So they're, they're a real critical piece of the puzzle. Uh, you have the influential sectors, the, the big players, the transportation planners, uh, planners, the city managers, the public works official, architects, engineers, um, advocacy groups, all kinds of different players that have influence over wayfinding. And then of course systems and policies um, which ultimately have tremendous influence on, on what actually rolls out. Um, and I'm going to go just one more slide to see what happens here. Okay. All right. So I wanted to come back uh, because these slides are playing out a little differently. Um, but here, here in the center, in the gray area, you see the wayfinding process. And essentially you show uh, some people there on the left-hand side. Um, and these people bring to the wayfinding experience different physical um, or cognitive uh, abilities. Uh, their emotional status may vary from day to day. Uh, you know, if you're upset about something, your, your wayfinding abilities may not be fully engaged. Uh, certainly people come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and then these people are embedded in a community environment, okay? And the community environment consists of the built environment, uh, the social environment, uh, the natural features. You know, there are mountains that you can use to orient yourself. Uh, certainly population characteristics. So perhaps it's a community that has a large population of people who's, uh, uh, who have low English literacy, let's say, which might affect signage. And then of course policies. Um, so you have this big community environment and then you have a, a smaller trip environment. So within any, within any given community there are many, many different trip environments. So think in terms of uh, the different routes that you might take to get to a meeting across town, okay? Um, so each of these trip environments is likely to be a little different and in that sense it's going to affect your ability to find your way. So in the center there, you see the people and you see the environment and you see the arrows between the two. And you know, basically what that is is suggesting that wayfinding is really an interaction of people and the environment. So we're out there, maybe we go out and we have a plan in mind of, of how we're going to get from A to B, but then we see something out there that causes us to change our minds for one reason or another and to choose a different route. Um, and that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. <laughs> it just depends on the situation. Um, it might depend on our goals, uh, whether we're walking for exercise or trying to get to work. 
it, and it might depend a lot on our familiarity with the area, whether we're generally familiar with the community and, and where we're headed, or, or whether it's entirely new to us. And I'm sure we, you know, we've all had that experience of uh, being in an unfamiliar place and being challenged to uh, effectively and safely find our way from place to place. Um, there are tools and technologies too that people use, an important part of the framework. So we have uh, certainly uh, tools that people can carry around with them uh, that, are, that are very useful. Um, you know, it might be something from a, like a smartphone. I'm sure many of you use those um, or use GPS in your cars. Uh, and then increasingly we're seeing tools and technologies that are embedded in the environment itself, so accessible pedestrian signals, for example, or tools and technologies that enable interaction between the individual who's carrying a device and a feature in the environment. All of these things very important uh, to promote uh, wayfinding. So, Something we, we don't think about that much, but it's really important, but collectively the ease of wayfinding across the community has potential to affect so many things that are important in our lives. So mobility, uh, safety, social and civic engagement, access to goods and services, um, economic vitality, and, and certainly also the health of individuals and of the community as a whole. Um, so all of these things are, are really important to think about, and so often, you know, where we are right now is is thinking about wayfinding much more narrowly. At the same time, there's quite a growing body of research that links wayfinding to important outcomes. Uh, so, for example, um, the negative impact of a poor transit wayfinding on the community engagement of, of people with disabilities, uh, creating uh, situations of, of social isolation. Uh, the impact of poor signage or, or low visibility uh, or poor design on, on motor vehicle crashes and pedestrian safety. And then finally getting lost. I mean perhaps the hazard that most of us think about when wayfinding is difficult. Um, if, if we're lost, it increases um, the potential for exposure to the elements if it's really hot or really cold, uh, the risk of injury, um, and unfortunately uh, can even heighten the risk for death. So overall, um, you know, we think in terms of the conceptual framework as a way to help us think more broadly about wayfinding, uh, to see ways to improve uh, or to enhance it and also um, to create much greater awareness of its impact on the many aspects of life that are important to all of us. Okay, so we're going to transition now to talking more about what we know about wayfinding practice and policy. And if you will bear with me for just a minute here, I have to pull up a different document. Ah, my cheat sheet. There we go. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the P's. Uh, people, places, uh, players or partners, uh, policies and practices. So first a word about the process of wayfinding. So think a little bit about your own needs. Um, so to find your way, you have to know where you are. Uh, you have to be oriented, okay? And then you make decisions. Perhaps you plan in advance, but maybe you also change, make decisions on the fly. And as you go along, your body, as well as your mind, monitors your progress and remembers uh, things that might be important for finding your way back. So the feeling of the past, the smells, the sounds, and so on. And then finally, um, you need to know when you've arrived. You, you have to achieve some closure.
so wayfinding then is very cognitively demanding, okay? And much, much more so in an unfamiliar environment. And, and to accomplish it, we need to make mental maps, okay? You need to have this image in our brain to, to help us find our way. And making these maps is infinitely easier if the places we visit are memorable um, and if they're legible, easy to quote, to read, um, and easy to understand. So if we saw that red building on the right, that's, that's likely to be something we would remember, whereas if we were in that very monotonous neighborhood um, that's also there on the right, that might be much more difficult for us to identify um, cues that would help us find our way and find our way back from a specific destination there. So one thing I want to be really clear about is that we're not just talking about signs. So no amount of signage is going to compensate for really poor design like that monotonous community on the previous slide. But oftentimes signs are the only solution that communities think of. And this is where we need everyone to, to really get on board and, and to work and to, again, help people think more broadly about wayfinding. So good design is the bottom line. We need differentiation. We need visual access, simplicity, and design for all users, young, old, with and without functional challenges, and so on. So science is really best considered in the context of an overall information system where information is presented in different ways for different users um, and where there's some sort of consistent family of signs or information from all, going all the way from, say, maps, um, paper maps to street side maps to various uh, kinds of signs all the way to apps. And then, then there's the matter of technologies. Um, so they have a definite role to play um, and increasingly are a part of our lives and, and a part of our wayfinding um, and are, of course, critically important um, in the case of visual impairment or other kinds of sensory or mobility limitations that um, make wayfinding more challenging for individuals. So technologies that enable the user to get information from the environment are increasingly common and very useful um, for folks. Um, and then finally, complex systems, uh, especially in the transportation arena, are increasingly important, um, increasingly available. So sometimes, um, Hello? Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Are you there, Becky? Okay, thank you. Yes, I had to switch phones. My battery died. Okay. <laughs> no, we can hear you now. Please. Okay, that's a relief. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so sometimes people say, I think one of the downsides about te technologies is sometimes people will say, so, so why do we need to worry about wayfinding? Soon we'll all just use our phones and the rest won't matter. So I think it's important to remember that the jury is really still out on that one and there are a lot of legitimate kinds of questions that remain to be resolved. Um, so perhaps you've, you've had the experience of, of using the GPS while driving and then the next time you have to go back to that destination, recognizing that you really haven't learned the route. So, so there is recent research that suggests that when you rely on a wayfinding device, that that may actually interfere with your ability to form a mental map. Um, and then there's a growing body of research that that's also points to some safety issues related to distraction and even changes in gait while using devices. So I think the bottom line is that technology, while important, is unlikely to replace the need for legible communities. 
um, and that you know increasingly we're going to see more and more uh, environmental and interactive systems approaches um, that will contribute in this area well, you know bringing technology uh, together with uh, good community uh, legibility. So this is kind of a fun slide. Uh, this depicts some of the key players along the community wayfinding pathway. So you have travelers there in the bottom left, uh, psychologists who help us understand human wayfinding, uh, architects who design buildings and community environments, along with engineers who focus on roadways and streetscape, uh, certainly universal design uh, experts and others who focus on access and usability for all, uh, transport professionals, uh, city and regional planners, uh, transportation planners. Uh, so when you look at this, you know, do you see some things that are missing? I certainly do. I mean, I don't see public health here. And again, I think, you know, wayfinding is a health issue and, and we should have public health here at the table. Um, we don't see citizens here. Uh, that's important. Um, I wonder if there are other things you notice when you look at this. Um, for me, what I see are, are lots of lines connecting these different professionals or disciplines to this pathway, but I don't see lines connecting them to one another. And I think that's an unfortunately familiar situation that we face and, and one that has to be resolved. Uh, getting people on the same page, communicating with each other if we're going to really achieve a change in this area. So now we're going to transition into talking about uh, practice and policy. And here's a quick true-false for you. Okay, think about these. Almost all communities have a wayfinding plan and budget. True or false? Public health goals are an integral part of most wayfinding plans. True or false? There are clear guidelines for pedestrian and bicycle wayfinding. Collaboration across jurisdictions is critical to ease of wayfinding. What do you think? So I think the really happy news is, the happy reality is that indeed most all communities do have some sort of structure and budget for wayfinding. And I say happy because I think this means that there are, in fact, resources that might be tweaked to strengthen wayfinding. Right now, um, many goals, uh, increasing walking, reducing injury, uh, promoting livable and accessible communities, are often not fully recognized or, or seen as priorities. Instead, many communities are still focusing primarily on branding or economic goals or strictly on motor vehicle transportation. And as I'm sure you know from your own experience, uh, the quality of the wayfinding environment is often less than desirable. And then it varies greatly from community to community and also within communities. So for example, think of the differences between a downtown commercial area and perhaps neighborhoods on the fringe of your city. So what accounts for these differences? So clearly problems and inconsistencies can result from cross-sector dis disciplines, who happens to be in charge. Um, from jurisdictional differences, um, for example, lack of coordination between a city and a county. Um, we have issue of spotty guidelines and best practices, so being well developed for driving, for example, but less well so for pedestrian and bicycle wayfinding. And then, of course, an overall lack of integrated planning across transportation modes. But then on a more positive note, um, there's certainly a growing number of communities, and, and Greenville will be one that we'll be talking about shortly, that are showing us how to create better wayfinding. So London in the UK is perhaps the most well-documented and evaluated and noteworthy among these. Um, it's interesting because it does have an explicit public health goal to promote walking. Their original assessment 
was that the city had 32 different wayfinding systems. So can you imagine? Talk about confusing. Um, but since, since implementing their new plan, um, they demonstrated increases in walking and much more sensible transit use. Um, I just highly recommend um, if you're really interested in wayfinding and you want to learn more about best practices, to go to their website, uh, Transport for London. You can just Google that. Uh, they have numerous and, and really very excellent resources on their website. Um, that could almost be a blueprint for your work. Here in the U.S., uh, we are seeing more attention to comprehensive wayfinding. Uh, it's cropping up in master plans, in um, pedestrian and bicycle plans. And also, uh, we can point to some initiatives like Nash Vitality in Nashville, Tennessee, um, that integrate public health goals like uh, in promoting physical activity um, into their wayfinding plans. Um, in this case, they use signs to promote physical activity. Um, we're also seeing more citizen action in this area. Uh, there's a very fun website called Walk Your City uh, that you can go to. Uh, you can actually design and order signs for your own use there. Uh, whether you're a city or a neighborhood or just an individual, um, there you can create signs for use in walking campaigns or uh, for any purpose to improve wayfinding. So I want to share with you too just some quick best practices examples uh, that are out there. Uh, clearly, heads up street side maps are are absolutely wonderful. That's a map that's oriented in the direction you're looking, so it saves a lot of mental acrobatics. Uh, you are here markers, uh, like the example depicted here in the like the upper right hand photo, um, is also very helpful. It helps you get oriented quickly. And then oftentimes you'll see walking contours around that you are here marker. So there are circles that show how far you might be able to walk in 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, which is a strategy that encourages walking and, and uh, may be particularly important for uh, people um, who are frail or perhaps have a chronic disease and need to be very careful about um, not overextending themselves. Um, while at the same time encouraging other folks to get out there and, and get busy and uh, recognize that it's an attainable goal. Um, community wayfinding as assessment is uh, rare, but it can readily be built into other kinds of walkability, safety, or related audits. Um, I'm, there you will see on your screen um, Easter Seals Project Action's Neighborhood Wayfinding Assessment Pocket Guide, which is a, a wonderful resource that can be used by um, neighborhood residents or citizens to um, get a quick view of what's actually happening in their own neighborhood relative to wayfinding and generate some data that they can take to their cities to perhaps um, create some changes. Um, and then, of course, intermodal uh, planning, um, I think a, uh, a best practice that we recognize is important for many reasons, but has certainly has relevance to wayfinding as well. So roles for everybody um, to uh, make a difference in this arena. We can all play important roles. Um, chief among these, I think promoting a broad vision of wayfinding um, that is gets beyond a strictly economic focus. Uh, effectively advocating for planning across modes and jurisdictions, and planning for the needs of all people rather than just the average person. Um, certainly contributing to evaluation of the wayfinding status and of progress. Um, and then identifying and disseminating best practices, standards, and guidelines. So if you're doing something way cool or if you know of a community that's doing something that other people need to know about. We need to find ways to share that more broadly uh, so that others can have direction and ideas for changes in their particular community. 
We do hope you will use the Pathways document to inform your colleagues and to open uh, dialogue with others with regard to, to community wayfinding. So again, think about it. Um, what role can you play? How can you make a difference in this area? Um, wayfinding may or may not be an integral part of your work at this point in time, but it is likely that it has um, an impact, uh, a relationship to something that you can do. That you can do. So think about how you can uh, build a community of practice with others to, to drive change. Uh, think about who you might engage. Um, you know, what's the status of, of wayfinding in, in your area of focus? What, what improvements are needed? What are achievable goals? What are action steps you might take? And you know, our hope is that you will take, that you will really see fit to take some action as a result of this session. Um, I always like to say that remember that uh, knowledge is fine, but action is divine. Um, so take, the, take a minute, if you will, to write down at least one action step that you might take as a result of this session or, or a wayfinding goal that you'd most like to achieve. And, and we invite you to put this in the text box, if you will, because we'd really like to, to see what that is and, and also just to uh, let you know that if there is some way that we can be helpful in providing some technical assistance. Uh, we're certainly receptive to that and uh, would be delighted to, to hear from you um, if there's a way that, again, that we can be helpful. I think together we can find a way. So join us and here's that website address again for getting the Pathways document. And I'm going to um, be quiet now and turn it over to Mary Douglas. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Good afternoon. As Christy mentioned, we're now going to take a look at some wayfinding examples from the City of Greenville, South Carolina. We've worked over the years to improve our overall connections and the visitors' experience here. And our goal in all of this is to make navigating our city easy and accessible for all. For context, I'd like to explain where Greenville is located. We are halfway between Atlanta, Georgia and Charlotte, North Carolina along Interstate 85 in the upstate region of South Carolina. And our population here in the city is approximately 61,000 and our metropolitan statistical area is 850,000. However, our city feels much larger than it is because it is the county seat for Greenville County and our daytime population grows to over 114,000 as people are commuting into Greenville daily for employment. Also in Greenville, downtown is the popular place to go for entertainment, dining, and shopping. Really downtown is the destination for meeting up with friends, entertaining guests, and enjoying outdoor concerts and events. But it really wasn't always that way. To set the stage on the city's wayfinding program, I'd like to show you some pictures and take you back in time to show what downtown looked like 40 years ago and why we needed a wayfinding program. Our downtown had declined significantly with the growth of the suburbs. Downtown was not much more than boarded up buildings on a wide main street. We literally had to build back our downtown and remake it completely. And the city has been working on this for over 35 years now. Uh, today, the city went through an extensive revitalization program, which started in the late 1970s and 1980s. We narrowed Main Street, added trees, and wide sidewalks. Our wayfinding program was just one element in this overall plan to remake downtown. And today you can see what it looks like. Today downtown is home to about 100, and re 100 retail shops and 120 restaurants. We also have a free trolley service that operates on the weekends for downtown visitors. 
and our award-winning park called Falls Park anchors the south end of our main street. It features a 355-foot pedestrian bridge that overlooks the 60-foot waterfall, and this is all located just steps from Main Street. This is one of the key destinations downtown. So in downtown, there are also public plazas for, for gatherings. New retail moving in, such as Brooks Brothers, which opened about this time last fall. We have well-designed streetscapes, concerts and other outdoor events, outdoor dining options, and the city essentially leases its real estate on the sidewalks for the restaurants. And the weather here in Greenville is pretty nice year-round, so most of the time you can dine outdoors year-round. And we also have new rooftop bars overlooking Main Street. In 2013, we had 309 event days on the calendar in downtown Greenville, so literally there is always something going on here. Now apartments are in the works. As more people want to live downtown and to have an urban lifestyle, we have close to 1,000 units planned and about 650 under construction. And we're actively working now with developers on other projects. Condos are coming back as well. Our art museums, concert halls, and public library are all located downtown at Heritage Green. This is our cultural campus. Having these venues downtown really gets people in the habit of coming to downtown Greenville. And Heritage Green recently went through a wayfinding program to better orient visitors through their campus, as you can see in these pictures. A very popular attraction downtown is the 17 and a half mile Swamp Rabbit Trail. This is a rails to trails conversion project that opened about five years ago. We continue to expand the trail so that people can ride throughout the city and stay active. A wayfinding program was developed for the trail, as you can see in the green sign here on the left. The trail does a great job of connecting people from their neighborhoods to other parts of the region. So as you can see, there's a lot of activity happening here and a lot of people coming in and out of our downtown. We are trying to appeal to people of all ages, from families to young professionals to empty nesters. Therefore, we needed a way to move people through downtown to all that is offered and to enhance their visit so their experience is the best it could possibly be. What we did was the city set about developing a wayfinding program in the late 1990s. We began with a downtown brand with a unified look and feel. We then developed some signage and multi-phases. Some signs are visitor related, such as those directing people over to Falls Park, the museums and art galleries and more. And we also have some that appeal to visitors in their cars. Others are a smaller scale that is meant to help people as they are walking or riding through downtown. We also have those that are more regulatory oriented, mainly on a vehicular scale. An example is the green and white interstate signs I'll refer to in just a few minutes. So Greenville's wayfinding program initially started to encourage people to park in the city's parking garages. And we will go over some lessons learned from this program. Overall in downtown, we have 10 parking garages that visitors pay to park in. There are hundreds of on-street parking spaces that are free for two hours. So there's a bit of an imbalance in that the best spaces are free and the more inconvenient spaces require you to pay. So we really needed a way to encourage visitors to use our garages. The program that we came up with incorporated the downtown brand into signage with the adopted color scheme. We also designed a large green and white P that you can see in these pictures that is uh, on all of our decks. Most of our wayfinding revolved around the Greenville G logo. You can see that at the bottom of the screen. So in our logo, the yellow center represents our city center. 
the blue represents the Reedy River that runs through the center of downtown. And the green circle on the outside represents our whole city. We made sure that our logo was authentic to Greenville because it is the icon that represents us. The standard color palette was adopted. That's the yellow, blue, and green that I mentioned in the previous slide. We are now using it for all of our city marketing since it was so well received. So once we finished the branding for the downtown parking garages, the city's economic development department staff completed a study on our existing signage to build on the new parking signs. We found that there were multiple opportunities where we could consolidate signs in order to reduce sign clutter downtown. And we're always looking for ways to reduce sign clutter. Our wayfinding efforts really evolved into a downtown brand. And we started using this brand on everything we did, from visitor kiosks right in the heart of downtown to our brochures, our signs and banners and maps for a consistent, recognizable look. We felt like by being consistent and carrying this look throughout downtown, our visitors will know that this is a special place and somewhere different than anywhere else in Greenville. Our wayfinding program extends to printed materials, too. These are the city's downtown visitor maps and guides that you see on the screen. We produce them in-house with our economic development staff each year. And we distribute them to area hotels, visitor centers, shops, and restaurants. And everyone seems to really love them. They are updated once per year and feature the city's downtown brand. We do post it to the city's website as well. And I'll show you our website at the end of the presentation. Um, and these maps are really meant to guide pedestrians. Now, a very well-received part of our wayfinding has been the side street signs, or what we call the more to enjoy signs. They are meant to guide pedestrians and to show people that there are options on the side streets. In Greenville, um, we're very much a linear downtown. It's, it's a nice walk down Main Street, but we're trying to branch off and build some depth to our downtown. And so these signs were a way to show people that there are shops and restaurants um, off of Maine. Some more details here on this program. Um, so we put these signs on the corners of Main Street. And as I said, they point to businesses there that are tourist related. Uh, they too have the same look and feel as the other signs in our city. The way the program works is it's a public-private partnership where we purchase the sign poles and frames with accommodations tax. And then the businesses pay a one-time fee of $150 to be listed on both sides of the sign. The signs are customizable, so adjustments can be made as new businesses open. Each business is essentially printed on a clear plastic slat. And that can be easily moved around. As new businesses open, we oftentimes have to re-alphabetize the order of the businesses because as you, you can imagine, every business wants to be listed at the top. So that's how we handle that as we alphabetize everyone. Here's another look at some of the signs. And this one is on the corner of Main and Washington Streets in the heart of downtown. And then just a few more pictures of the signs. We make sure that they're up high enough not to interfere with people walking around downtown, but they're still low enough that they're easy to read. Another part of the city's wayfinding is our large scale entrance signs at downtown's gateways. There are three of these downtown. One welcomes visitors while the other two say enjoy downtown Greenville. Again, these signs use downtown's color palette and overall look. And they help people to know that they've arrived here. Another part of our wayfinding program is our destination signage. So in this instance, about seven years ago, the city developed these signs in-house. We identified a need to show people how to get to Falls Park, which is located down on the south end of Main Street. 
what we did was we attached these signs to existing light poles in each block, and we were careful not to put too many of them along the street. We ended up with free space on the back of the signs, so we added a downtown map to the back. What we do as a city always requires a delicate balancing act, and there is a sensitivity that a program like this requires. What we learned is to be sensitive to the needs of the small businesses. Some merchants told us that they, who were located in the north end of Main Street, felt like we were steering pedestrian traffic too much to the south away from their businesses. That was something we really hadn't thought of originally, but fortunately today the signs have been up long enough now that we really don't hear um, those comments anymore. Everyone seems to like the signs because they oftentimes, as merchants, they get asked questions as far as how to get down to the park, and they can tell them that these signs are there on Main Street. Our overhead street signs are vehicular oriented. They feature the name of the street in a large font with our standard downtown colors. They're different than what exists in other locations in the city. Here's another look at those street signs. We developed a solution within the existing mast arms by using the leftover space to the right and left of the traffic lights, and that's where the sign frame goes. We periodically have to replace our signs due to general fading and wear and tear, and that's important to keep in mind when you're developing your budget. We're on our second set of these signs, which were originally added to the mast arms about 15 to 20 years ago. Here's an example of how we had a need and the creative wayfinding solution that was developed as a result. These are called the downtown activity signs. As downtown Greenville continues to grow as a tourist destination, we started seeing an uptick in businesses like horse-drawn carriages, walking tours, and pedicab services. They all wanted signs on Main Street. But our zoning code prohibits signs unless they have a physical location for their businesses. None of these businesses had buildings downtown, so they would not be able to put signs out on the sidewalk. But at the same time, the city wanted people to know about them, and they do have a business license, and they are valid city businesses. So we developed these signs to blend in with the existing program and developed this solution. There are four of these downtown, and for a small fee, similar to the More to Enjoy Side Street program, the business can be listed with their business name and contact information. These are clearly geared towards those walking downtown, and they promote downtown activities only. Here are some other examples of our downtown brand. If you walk downtown, you can find our logo on our sewer manhole covers where we have the G logo and a phrase that says, enjoy Greenville's downtown. And again, we want people to have a positive experience, so it's all about the details. On the right, we also have new no skateboarding signs in our standard color palette, and these are attached to the pedestrian light posts. Another thing we've done is to provide wayfinding through public art. Our Mice on Main program consists of nine bronze mice along Main Street. You can see that in the left-hand picture. Visitors go from one end of Main Street to another searching for these mice using clues, which we adapted from the well-known children's book called Goodnight Moon. We also have quotes installed in the sidewalk in front of a downtown hotel and office complex, which adds interest as people walk through the city center. So I think the point here is that Greenville likes to try things to see how they work for people, because our goal is to make the experiences here really unique and memorable. Now that we talked about downtown, we're going to talk briefly about our greater city and what we've done there. Back in 2006, we set aside staff and some resources for an overall unified wayfinding signage program along major city corridors. This program was designed by the city's staff in-house, and the local sign company produced the actual signs. We looked at improving the city limit signs, 
so there are attractive entrances as people are coming into the city. We also looked at new signs for the districts around Greenville. Finally, we did look at new signs as vis visitors travel into downtown. This program really built on the foundation we built downtown that we talked about earlier. What you see here, uh, this map shows the three zones of our program. We started out broad with the city limit and welcome signs. Moving in to the city center, zone two included the collector streets. Then we drilled down to a district identity. The idea essentially here was to tell people that they're in the city limits. Then once they're in the city limits, to show them where the destinations are located. And then once they're close to that destination, where to go from there. This point is best illustrated with these next few slides, and I'll show you pictures of our signage. These signs are at the city limits of Greenville. Then the signs that show multiple destinations at our collector streets, you know, as you're coming into the city. Our staff developed a sign index, which you can see on the right. I know you can't read it, but it's just a spreadsheet that shows you the different streets and then the different destinations. So we did a sign index for each specific intersection, as shown here. And we went to our city executive staff who determined which venues would ultimately be listed on the signs. Since you can't list everything, and space is limited. So you have to be strategic about what you think will be um, most popular for people as they're coming in. Again, the sign on the left shows you the variety of places within the area. And then the sign on the right, this sign example is loca located close in to the destination and shows motorists where to turn to get to that destination. These pictures uh, show some existing signs coming into the city. And these are destination signs and list out a variety of, of places. Everything from our um, convention center to our performing arts center, our zoo, the park, the baseball park, things like that. And now once you've arrived at the destination, in this case the destination is Heritage Green, where our art museums are located, this sign then shows you what the options are there. And then what we ultimately ended up with, I think we felt like the, the sign here was just too long, and so we consolidated and made it general museums, public library, and theater. We also included the interstates coming into Greenville. We identified the destinations that needed to be shown along the interstates, such as our downtown, our baseball stadium, um, our sports and entertainment arena, universities, our convention center, et cetera. And we worked with the Department of Transportation to ensure um, that we were in compliance and that they were listed. Now they ended up only permitting the standard green and white vehicular signs, but at least our landmarks were identified along the interstates. So in summary, uh, we first went through an analysis and asked ourselves, what is it that we're trying to achieve with the wayfinding program? And we tried to determine who our target market was. We then took some time and hired professionals here in Greenville to develop a unified look and feel through a standard color, palette, and overall brand. We made sure that the program was authentic to the area and included a diverse group of city staff and downtown business owners and other key stakeholders in the development of the program. We made sure that all areas of the city had attractive, easy to read signs. We didn't try to do it all at one time, but instead we allowed it to evolve over time and we added new things as our city grows. We felt like a phased approach really worked best for us in what we were trying to accomplish. So I think that's important to keep in mind that you don't have to do it all at one time, but instead just sort of phase it in over time and as your funding allows. So this concludes my remarks. And we certainly hope you'll come visit us in Greenville one day soon. And thanks for your participation today. I will now turn it back over to Christy. All right, thank you, Mary Douglas, and uh, thank you also, Becky, uh, for the great presentation. 
Um, it is now time for us to uh, take your questions. Um, you're going to have two ways uh, in which to do this. You can either ask your question over the phone, uh, or you can ask your question via the chat section. Um, I'm going to ask Don uh, to come back and uh, give instructions on how you can ask questions over the phone. If you would like to ask a question, simply press star then the number 1. Again, to ask an audio question, please press star 1. We'll give just a second for that um, uh, for people to get in the queue there and ask their questions. But again, you can ask questions in the chat section uh, or um, over the phone. And there are no audio questions at this time. I see a question that has come into the chat section. Uh, this appears to be a question for Mary Douglas. And it says, can you please tell us if, the, if downtown has ATS devices on the traffic light? Okay. Um, APS, what, I'm sorry, what does that stand for? Yeah, I'm not sure either. If, if you could uh, clarify what APS stands for. Accessible pedestrian signals. Ah, very good. Accessible okay. Pedestrian signals. We, do in, we do in some intersections and in some locations downtown. Um, we that is something we would like to phase in as we can, but we do just have in a few specific areas. Was that plan um, uh, as far as how you're going to be installing the accessible pedestrian signals? Is that by um, which one is used more, or how was that planned out? We look at the the needs and where people are coming from. And for example, we have a high rise building that's residential, and uh, individuals with di disabilities are are mainly living there. And there was a grocery store across the street from the complex, and it was a major thoroughfare downtown. And so we did add the audible signal there, um, but we just tried to accommodate our population as best as we can. Mm -hmm. And um, another question, Mary Douglas, for you um, was about who came up with the plan. Uh, I assume it was a group of people. Yes, uh, it was a variety of people. We had a, a creative firm here in Greenville work with us on that. Uh, their name is Brains on Fire, <laughs> kind of an interesting name. A very creative group that sat down with city staff and brainstormed about our city. And of course, they knew Greenville. So that helped, and um, we also included our city traffic engineer, our public information and events officer, economic development staff, and some downtown business owners. Okay, great. Um, now the questions are coming in. Uh, I'll read the next one, which is um, also for Mary Douglas. Although um, Becky, you might have some uh, some uh, comments on this as well, just not specifically to Greenville, but. Um, what are the challenges in managing um, the city and business partnerships, so like the public and private partnerships? Have you encountered any challenges? Um, okay. So Becky, you go ahead. No, no, no. I think that's – why don't you talk about it from your perspective? Because you did mention the, you know, kind of tension with the, you know, I guess it was the north end or <laughs> getting mm -hmm. left out initially, you know, so you do have to negotiate those kinds of things with people. And Yes, I think it requires uh, staying in touch with the businesses and I'm essentially a liaison to our businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to, to hear them out and they always seem to present something that we hadn't thought about as a city. So I think it's important to be open to ideas and suggestions. You do have to be careful. You can't really play favorites. And that's how we had to come up with alphabetizing the businesses on the signs because everybody, like I said, just really wants to be at the top of, of the sign. So um, coming up with with creative solutions that don't favor one business over the other, you really have to keep every or you have to treat everyone the same, and do the best you can with that. Uh, yeah, everybody, go ahead. A too, I think, kind of implicit in the whole thing is the idea that you're all in this together. You know, so um, the city has something to gain as a whole. You know, each business has something to gain. You know, the 
the private sector and, and the public sector. So um, that it seems like you know what you've done in Greenville represents that very well. All right, I do see that we have a question on the phone. Don, if you could let us know who's calling. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. There is a question from the line of Warren Seacrest. Great. Hi, Mary. Yes. Yeah, nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I missed it. Um, I was looking for transportation signage, specifically public transit, fixed route, trolleys, et cetera? Good question. Um, our trolley is sort of evolving over time. And our trolley, we've had signs up downtown, but it's more of a tourist um, experience. And so the trolley doesn't really have fixed stops, so to speak. And you essentially flag down the trolley and, and hop on. But I'll be glad to follow up with some examples of the signs that we do have. And also, um, there is a bus system here called Greenlink. And um, that would have been a great thing to include in this presentation that I didn't think to do. But um, Greenlink does have stops throughout the county and the upstate region. We have now started adding solar powered um, bus shelters. And those are throughout Greenville. So um, if you wanted to Google GreenLink to see some of the things sure going enough. on here. Sure. OK. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. So let's go back to the chat questions. We have a few. Let me get up to where I was here. The questions are coming in now. So <laughs> OK, let's see here. Okay, there we are. So um, there's a question, uh, Mary Douglas, about funding and, and how you were able to get the project going with funding. Is that information that you're able to share? Yes. And in Greenville, it's uh, identifying a funding source. We used tax increment financing, which is a downtown funding source for our wayfinding project. But it ended up being around $250,000 um, over time. And so it was important that we had a plan, that we went to our city council and asked for the funding to support the plan. A lot of times we brief our council early on, and they're involved with the development of the, the project. And in this case, they were there. Um, they understood the need to brand the city. And so I think it was developing that plan and then ultimately going to get the funding for it. Um, fortunately, here in Greenville, our city council believes in downtown. And they, they believe in our commercial corridors. And we just viewed it as another economic development strategy for growing our city. So I think that leadership was with us in the development of the project. And that helped to make it successful. All right, great. Um, do you have any? Uh, this, this, this is um, actually a question for me. This is for Christy. Um, um, do you have any idea of how much this has grown since you've taken on this project? How much we've grown? Mm -hmm. um, our population has grown some. It's um, very difficult in South Carolina to annex properties into the city, and so we've okay. had to grow from within. And that's one reason why there is such an emphasis on redeveloping downtown and the commercial areas is to strengthen what we already have. Mm -hmm. So um, we, if you look at our numbers from the census data, we probably haven't grown that much. But we have grown from a tax standpoint as far as new businesses coming in and some of the new projects that are happening. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Great. Right, I'm going to ask Juan one more time to give instructions for the phone, and then we have another question on the chat we'll take after that. Don, if you could give the instructions once more. Once more, if you would like to ask a question, simply press star, then the number 1. Very right, great. So let's go ahead and uh, take uh, our last uh, chat section question, and then uh, if, we'll, if we get any more phone questions, we'll take that after this. 
Um, so the question is, um, has, have any of, of the other cities within the county where Greenville is, have any of the other cities uh, adapted these wayfinding concepts as well? Yes, um, there are about six other municipalities in the county of Greenville, and they are all working on revitalizing their downtowns and cities. If you look at a, a town called Traveler's Rest, this is north of Greenville. They have hired a consultant and have created a great wayfinding and branding program in their in their town. And again, it's called the Town of Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Um, some other things have been done in Fountain Inn, in Simpsonville. Greer downtown has a lot happening with their Greer Development Corporation and their signage. So um, it seems to be very popular in Greenville County as people are working on revitalizing their areas. Great, great. We have one more question uh, we'll take before we uh, make our closing comments, and that's uh, from the chat. It says, does the 250000 figure cover everything, including the development, uh, the branding, the sign construction, et cetera? It does uh, for the most part with the polls, the um, the signage, the the creative work that Brains on Buyer did. And again, this was done years and years ago. So we have over time added to our wayfinding and it, it probably has gone up to more like three hundred thousand total that we've spent over the over the years. But that that is including the creative work. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, we are getting close to the end here, and then since we're out of questions, we'll go ahead and uh, and close for the day. Um, I do want to say thank you very, very much um, uh, for the great presentations from Mary Douglas and from Becky. Um, we do want to ask all of the participants today if you would please take a moment to uh, fill out an evaluation survey uh, with your feedback. Uh, we do use your feedback to um, improve future events. Uh, I'll be sending an email to everyone uh, in just a few minutes that registered with the um, evaluation link, but the evaluation link is also uh, on your screen right now, so you can use that as well. Um, I know that we all want to thank uh, Becky and Mary Douglas for their uh, presentations today, um, but I also want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, Becky and Mary Douglas, do you have any closing comments? No, not really. Um, just encourage everyone to get involved if you're not already involved, and if there's any way that, that we can be of assistance, uh, we are happy to do so. Thank you. Yes, and I'm happy to help as well. Uh, not that the way Greenville has done it is the way you have to do it, but it just is some ideas for you as you work on your programs. All right. Thank you, ladies, so much. Uh, and again, thank you all for your participation. Uh, please watch our website, which is projectaction.org, uh, and your email for future Project Action events. Um, but most importantly, thank you for your commitment to increasing and improving accessible transportation in your community. We hope you have a great day. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold your lines. <laughs>